righty, let's get started with our grammar. Go ahead and turn to page 55 in your grammar books. Um, and by the way, just so you know, oh, I don't know why this is so light. Let's see. That's not helping. <laughs> Weird, what is going on now? Oh boy, okay, hold on just a second here. Let me see if I can fix that. For whatever reason, it froze. Okay, got it now. Um, next month in December, um, there are actually three weeks before Christmas break. So I, I think I made a mistake last time I talked about December and I thought there were only two weeks. So just so you know, we'll have three more weeks and then we'll take two weeks off for Christmas break, it'll be the week before Christmas and the week after Christmas, just like the traditional school schedule, just so you guys have a heads up on that. All right, uh, we're talking about sentences today, um, different types of run-on sentences. So a run-on sentence is obviously a sentence that is too long, and it often occurs when a sentence has main clauses that are not connected properly. And remember a main clause has a subject and a verb and is a complete thought and it can stand alone. So sometimes a run on sentence would be two main clauses put together without correct punctuation. And there are two types of run ons. There's a fused sentence and comma splice. So here's your examples. Uh, this is a fused sentence. It's two main clauses placed in one sentence without any punctuation between them. So it says here the example, a frog sat on the steps, Dorinda looked horrified. Obviously those are two completely different thoughts and they don't really fit together. So that would be a run on a fused sentence. Um, and then here, Dorinda was furious she slammed the door. Dorinda told what happened. The king was displeased. So a comma splice is when there's a comma that shouldn't actually be there. Um, and it's, it's the only thing that's separating the two main clauses. So if it has two main clauses placed in one sentence with only a comma between them, um, that is called a comma splice. It really should be a period. So that's what we're going to talk about next is there are three simple ways to fix a run on sentence and this is part of your homework on the pages that follow this um so this is something you're going to have to look for and you can refer back to this page if you need to to remind you how to fix those things so a period obviously that is the most common way to fix a run on sentence like that example up here a frog sat on the steps period Dorinda looked horrified. <clears throat> and so when you have a sentence that is an expression of one idea, so if the main clauses are separate ideas, they belong in two separate sentences. So this is talking about a frog, and this is talking about Dorinda looked horrified. And it could be that she looked horrified because she saw the frog, but these are two completely different thoughts here. So you do need a period to fix that one. Um, and then a semicolon, that's kind of tricky. We don't use those very often, but there is a rule about the semicolon. Dorinda was furious. She slammed the door. That's from this example up above where they had a comma, but this is a better fix right here with a semicolon. A semicolon can fix a run-on. However, it cannot always join main clauses. 
It should only be used when the two main clauses ex express a single idea and are similar in length um, or construction. And you're gonna use semicolon sparingly. So slamming the door was how Dorinda expressed her anger. Um, so both main clauses express a single idea. So this is how she expressed her anger. Um, and because there's both short sentences, that's another good place to put a semicolon. So if you have longer sentences or one long and one short, that's not a good place for a semicolon. Um, so that is where and when you would use a semicolon. And then here we have a comma plus a coordinating conjunction. Sorry, I have a little cold, so I might have to blow my nose sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, Dorinda told what happened, comma, and the king was displeased. So that's the fix from this one up here. Dorinda told what happened, the king was displeased. Um, you would use and here and a comma. So when a coordinating conjunction best expresses the relationship between the two main clauses, connect the main clauses with a comma and a coordinating conjunction. Remember, these are the coordinating conjunctions right here for and, nor, but, or, yet, so. Um, and it's connecting, it's, it's connecting the relationship between the two. Um, so we need a comma and then and. And this is different than if you are listing um, maybe adjectives or items or events. When you're listing, you don't need and, I mean, you don't need a comma if you're only listing two things, but these are two thoughts. And so they express, and it expresses the relationship between the two main clauses. So you do need a comma here and the word and. Okay. Any questions so far about what we're talking about? Are you guys good? You're good, okay. Dorinda told what happened and the king was displeased. So this is grammatically wrong. This one does not have the comma or the and. If you connect two main clauses with a coordinating conjunction, you must place a comma before the coordinating conjunction. The comma without the CC is a comma splice. The coordinating conjunction without a comma is a comma error. So this would be a comma error here. And that's why you need to have the comma and the and after the comma when you're connecting those two main clauses together. Okay, and down here, they're showing how they fixed these run-on sentences at the bottom. Dorinda knew she was in trouble. Um, the staff remained silent. So Dur what Dorinda knew and how the staff remained are separate ideas. These are two separate ideas. Dorinda knew she was in trouble. The staff remained silent. So putting a period and a second sentence there is the best way to fix that run on. The butler smirked, a footman sighed. So on this one, both the butler and the footman are responding to Dorinda's attitude. So their responses, express a single idea. They're both responding to the same idea. The main clauses are similar in length. And so you would use a, a semicolon for this one. And down here, um, two footmen removed the salad and two more served the entree. So two more footmen served the entree after two removed the salad. So the second sentence follows the first. It's it's adding to what the first sentence, what the first part of the sentence says. So you just use a comma and the CC there and. And then there's a little note at the very bottom of your page that says this week's fix it provides specific directions for fixing run on sentences. So we'll look at that in a minute too, but go ahead and turn to page 56. <clears throat> Commas and periods and semicolons and all that, it just takes practice. You'll start to see the trend as you go through these homework assignments. 
this week, um, and we will be talking about this more as we work through the book. But these are the rules. Um, and now we're going to talk about quote and attribution. So basically, when you're writing a story like the Tom Sawyer and Tom is speaking, that's when you use quotes and an, and the attribution like Tom Sawyer said or, or whoever was speaking. Uh, it could be a reference in a research paper. If you're quoting an author, you're wanting to give a direct quote about some information you find in a research in your in the books that you're researching. Um, that's when you also use attribution and quotation marks. So look at this first one. I will not serve the frog is the quote. It's a quote in the sentence is the sentence in quotation marks as obvious, right? Quotation marks around the quote to show that these are the speaker's exact words. Um, and then a quote may be one or more sentences long and must be punctuated correctly with capital letters and end marks, commas and periods always go inside closing quotation marks. So that's something that sometimes I used to forget, like where does the period go before the quote or after the quote? So it always goes before the end quote. Exclamation marks and question marks go inside closing quotation marks when they are part of the quoted material. So it's, you know, if the person is asking a question, then the question mark goes inside the quotation marks. It's pretty easy to remember that part. Um, and then we have the attribution, the princess said. That's the attribution is a person speaking and the speaking verb. So here we have said, but you know, that's a band word now for us. So you would have to come up with something other than said if you're using that in your stories. Although the attribution contains a main clause, subject and verb, it does not express a complete thought. So even though the princess said has the subject princess and the verb said, it's still not a complete thought. Um, what did the princess say? The quote, which tells what the princess, princess said, must be in the same sentence as the attribution in order for the sentence to make sense. An attribution sets up a direct quote. It may, be, it may proceed, interrupt, or follow the quote. The first word of the attribution is capitalized when the attribution begins the sentence. And here's a little key on the side. This will be good for you to refer back to, especially even when you're writing more about Tom Sawyer this coming up week, um, because there's a lot of speaking lines in that story that you might want to use. And here's how you punctuate. So yeah, the attribution, that's who's speaking. Tom Sawyer said, comma, and then the quote and the period inside the quote. Here's an example of the quote first, then the attribution. Notice the comma is on the inside of the quotation mark. Attribution, and then the rest of quoted sentence. So you'd use a comma there. So sometimes you can break up what they say by putting the attribution in the middle. Here, if the um, quote comes first, you would capitalize the first word of the quote, comma, and then attribution is lowercase, unless of course it's a name. Here, if you have the attribution first is capital, comma, and then quote with a question mark. It's just showing you some different examples. If it's a question and then attribution, and then here's an exclamation. So use this little key right here on this page when you're writing your stories. Um, and we can also use this when we get to the research part of the class, when you're quoting from research material. Okay. Um, and just here is more explanation of that. So we have two main clauses. Remember, the attribution is also a main clause. It has the subject verb in it. But you need the other main clause in order for it to make sense. So here it is, the attribution, comma, and then the quote. Um, and then here, the next one, we have the question, must I serve the frog with a question mark and a quote? And then the princess asked, notice there's no comma here. So when you have a question and then the attribution, there's no comma after that. 
Here's the example. The princess wailed for several minutes. I will not serve the frog. So here we have two separate sentences. This example shows two clauses, a main clause and, a, and then a main clause, because Dorinda wailed for several minutes expresses a complete thought. It is not an attribution. Both main clauses require end marks. So even though it's not attribution, we know we can assume as we read that before what she says, this is her speaking. So the princess wailed for several minutes. I will not serve the frog. Okay, so that's how you would set that up. The princess said that she will not serve the frog. This one has a that clause. So even though it's telling us what the princess did say, it's not used as a direct quote. So when you have that, it's just a complete sentence. You just put it together like a whole sentence. Um, the main clause and the that clause just go right together with no comma, no quotation marks. Uh, that's called an indirect quote. Okay, so a direct quote obviously has quotation marks. This one does not, so it's an indirect quote. All right, we're just going to look for a second on page 57. I'm going to have you do this as part of your homework. But I wanted you to see here um, at the bottom of this fix it list, it does say fix run on with a period. So it does give you the clue on how what you're looking for as far as your run on sentence in your example here. So uh, that's true for each one. Some of them like on page 59, it says fix run ons with semicolon and period. So that's your clue to know how to fix it. Remember, Go back to your learning page that we just went over to help you figure out where it needs to go. And like usual, I will give you the answer key, but try to do it on your own first, like you normally do. And we'll see how it goes from there. Do you guys have any questions about this grammar lesson? No? No, okay. All right, well, that's it for grammar. Okay, so your homework, uh, by the way, and I know I talked to Melinda's mom about this, or I messaged her anyway, the um, first paragraph of the Tom Sawyer um, story was not due until Wednesday, so you're fine if you haven't finished that yet. Uh, I'm, I kept the same due date, just so you guys have plenty of time to finish up that. And by the way, next week, we'll go back to our regular schedule on Thursdays. Um, so you'll have a little extra time this week to get things done. So please get out your story sequence chart for Tom Sawyer, because I know we did the Roman numeral one together in class last week. So you need your story sequence chart and you need the Tom Sawyer story itself, the original. So go ahead and get those two things out. <clears throat> so your homework assignment was to rewrite just paragraph one of the Tom Sawyer story following the checklist, um, which includes the three dress ups that we've been working on, actually the four dress ups we've been working on. So L-Y adverb, who, which clause, strong verb and because clause. And so I still want you to do that if you haven't finished that yet. I still want you to do that by Wednesday. Um, and then for this following week, I've decided to change it up a little bit. And I think this will be actually kind of fun to do. So, uh, but for today in class, a couple of things I want to talk to you about really quick. Just keep those things ready for you because um, we'll talk about that. But I want to show you, you don't have to write this down. I just want to talk to you about a couple of things. So one of the dress ups is a strong verb. And I've noticed a couple of times students have underlined an ing word, a verb with ing ending. Sometimes 
uh, verbs with ing endings are actually not a verb. They are called a verbal. Have you guys ever heard of a verbal before? No? So um, a verbal uh, is not exactly a verb. So we have to understand the difference. So if I have a, a word like swimming, And I think we've talked about this before in this class, but just as a little reminder, that word swimming, when you first look at it, it does sound like a verb. It sounds like an action, right? Somebody doing something, swimming in the swimming pool. But the word swimming can be used as an adjective and not a verb, like what I just said, swimming pool. If I were to say, um, I'm going to jump in the swimming pool, Swimming actually acts as an adjective in that sentence. So you cannot underline that as a verb when it's actually operating or being used as an adjective. So you have to be really careful on how these ing words um, are used in the sentence. And so it's a good rule of thumb to not underline a word that has an ing ending. However, there are some exceptions to that rule. Like if you have the word, I'm gonna skip down here and we'll put verbs here. Like uh, swing. Obviously I'm going to swing um, at the park. That is a verb. Right, and it has the ing, but it's not used like this one as an ending here. That actually changes the word sometimes in sentences or sting or um, sing. Okay, those are actually verbs, swing, sting, sing. Uh, but you, there's, they're a little different than adding an ing at the end of a base word that is a verb. All right, let me see if I can explain this a little bit better. Sometimes even like singing, let's take singing, for instance. If I say singing, I'm going to add this one up here. If I add ing to it, now it's a verbal, okay? Here it's a verb sing, to sing. But if I add ing to it, that becomes a verbal because if I say singing in the shower is fun, then singing becomes a noun. It's a thing that I'm, that's, it's a thing. Singing in the shower is fun. Or if I say like the word stealing, stealing Ellen from Netherby was a good idea. It actually is a thing that um, happened with Ellen. So here again, when we add ing, it's changing that word into a verbal. Okay, if I use the word challenging, like if I have, uh, my challenging sister, my challenging sister, <laughs> That can be, that actually is an adjective that's describing the sister. She is challenging, it's describing her. So these are examples right here of verbals because they can act as other types of speech like noun or adjective. So sometimes even a word like um, a participle, like, the word studying, if I use studying at the beginning of the sentence, if I say studying until midnight, Melina aced her algebra test. Remember participles come at the beginning of the sentence and they usually have an ing. So studying until midnight, even though it sounds like it's an action, the way it's used in that sentence, it's a participle. So you wouldn't underline that as a strong verb. So I think the best rule of thumb for us when we're using strong words in our stories is to pick something different than an ing word. Even for instance, like 
cooking the hot dogs without, with great care. Um, here's an example that I came up with cooking the hot dogs with great care. Jasper successfully entertained his friends. So entertained would be the verb in that sentence, but cooking the hot dogs is the participle, right? So that came at the beginning of the sentence. Do you guys have any questions about uh, verbal verbs, participles so far? Okay. So you need to come up with other types of verbs when you're looking for a strong verb. It's best to avoid marking ing words as strong verbs because it might actually be a verbal instead. All right. And sometimes a verb can also be a noun or an adjective like the word golf. Um, the word golf, I'll just put that one down here. I could say we golf every week and golf would be a verb. Or I could say golf is boring because it's a thing, right? Golf is boring to watch or whatever. Um, or an adjective, please bring me the golf clubs. So that one can change as well. Okay. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about as far as strong verbs. So avoid ing, look for other ways to use strong verbs. And don't forget your band words. As you're working on your uh, paragraphs this week, watch for those band words. Remember, you have a list on your blue page. Make sure you have that out with you when you get to the part of writing. We have think, thought, come, came, go, went, want, wanted, say, said, go, went, uh, oh, I already said that. And then see saw. So those are the those are the words that you don't want to use anymore in your writing. So what I recommend is you write your paragraphs and then go back and check if you have any of those band words, but keep them in your mind because you might be able to catch those as you're writing. So you don't have to actually go back and fix them. You can just remember as you go. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's look at your keyword outline now. And the 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 story, the Tom Sawyer story, it's kind of long, so I don't really want to take the time to reread the whole thing. Um but let's just kind of recap and you can look at your your Roman numeral 1 on your story sequence chart. So um, Jasper, can you look at your Roman numeral one and just kind of like practice? You remember how we used to look down and think of a sentence and then look up and say the sentence? Can you practice that for a Roman numeral one for us? And then we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, Tom Sawyer had to work. Uh, yeah, Tom Sawyer had to work to paint a fence. And do you want me to do the whole paragraph? Yeah, go ahead and do the whole paragraph and I'll have Melina do something different. He was in despair because all of his plans for that day were ruined. And he would he was worried that the boys would tease him. At, oh, his heart and his heart was burning. He had a magnificent and great inspiration. His friend Ben was pretending to be a boat. Okay, good. Um, the only thing you forgot to do was look up as you were telling me that, but um, but I got the idea. Yeah, that's okay. And you can be practicing that because um, it's good to, to practice um, public speaking like that, to look up at your audience. So, and that was good. I know it's been a while since we read the story, so it's probably a little hard to remember the details. <laughs> But yeah, so the story starts out where Tom Sawyer is, has a job to do, right? He's working. He has to paint this fence. And remember, the fence was ridiculously huge. It was like nine feet tall, I think, and like 90 feet long, a really big, huge fence that he had to work on. Um, and then he had plans. Do you guys remember what he originally wanted to do? 
Melina, do you remember, like, why was he disappointed? What did he originally want to do? I don't really remember, like, I don't think he had like certain plans. Like, did he say he did? Yeah, you're right. I'm looking back too. You guys can get out your original so you can remind yourself. But yeah, it just said that he was thinking of the fun he had planned. So probably playing with his friends or exploring the forest or something like that. But you're right. It didn't have specifics, um, but he was disappointed and, and um, you know, a little bit bummed out that he wasn't going to be able to just play. He had a job to do. So, um, and then he knew his friends were going to come along. Remember that part and how he was anticipating them teasing him because he had to work. So, um, and he, he kind of knew he was going to get teased and jabbed, you know, as far as from his friends for not playing. Ah, here comes Grant. We'll catch him up to speed here. Good morning, Grant. <laughs> I figured you forgot. I messaged you guys last night, but I don't think you got it. But thanks for, uh, you're on mute. I don't know what you're saying. So I, I got it, but I oh. set my alarm and I hit the snooze button once and it didn't go off a second time. Oh no, that's the worst. And mom called me literally like one minute ago. <laughs> nine and I'm like they're like halfway done <laughs> well thanks for coming on and I, I recorded this so you can go back later and watch what you missed um okay. basically we're looking at the Tom Sawyer original story and then we're also looking at your key word outline or your story sequence chart so if you can get those two things out that's what we're working on right now is this all we've done so far yeah, well, we did the grammar. You missed that lesson. And we just now are kind of reviewing what the story was about. And then we're going to move on to Roman numeral two and three of your story sequence chart. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're refreshing our memory. And he's anticipating his friends coming to tease him and bother him. Okay, so let's look at... And you guys can keep out the original, like I said, because it's it's going to help you refresh your memory. I don't really want to read the whole thing because that'll take a little too long. So go ahead and get out your story sequence chart now. And um, I'm going to, you guys already have this. I'm just going to put mine here. Whoops. Three, four, and then we're on number two. My pen is, I need to get a new pen. And then Roman numeral three, one, two, three, four. All right. And you guys have all this filled in on the side here, but just so you know where I'm at, you, we already did this one from last week for Roman numeral one. So now we're going to move on to Roman numeral two. Um, and now we're at the point where there's a, a conflict and it begins with Ben, his friend, coming to tease Tom. And do you remember what Ben said to Tom? You can look back on the story if you need to, as far as that point where uh, Ben comes on the scene and he, maybe not the first thing he says, but he's pretending he's a boat and he's tingling, ting, ting, ling, ling. He's pretending he's the boat. And what does he call Tom? A stump. There you go. Good. So we're going to put B for Ben here. And then we're going to put stump. And we decided that a stump just means like he's not, he's ignoring Ben, right? Because when you think about a tree stump, it's just there. It's not doing anything. And so he's, that's how he decides to describe Tom. Any anytime you have a friend that's ignoring you, you could say, "Don't be a stump. Why are you being a stump?" <laughs> and they'll go, "What?" <laughs> so might be kind of good. Um, and then he says, "You're a stump," 
And then what is it that, um, what else does Ben say after that? What is he going to go do? I think he's going to go swimming, right? Swimming. Yep, that's right. So he's like, I'm going to go swimming. And then you just, um, he's like, don't you wish you could go too? But of course you can't because you have to work. So he's being really snarky right here. Okay. So um, let me zoom in a little bit so you guys can see that better. And then after that, what does Tom begin to do after Ben says that? And you can look back on the original here. Tom, I think Tom sees himself as an artist, right? He's he's kind of making this job that he has to do with the fence sound intriguing. So, um, and he says, he says, what do you call work? Why that ain't work? Well, maybe it is, maybe it ain't. All I know is it suits Tom Sawyer. Oh, come now. You don't mean it let on like you like it. Like it? Well, I don't see why I ought to like it. Does a boy get a chance to whitewash a fence every day? And so he's kind of making it uh, sound like he's, um, let me see, my note says artist, like he's being an artist and he's concentrating on his work. So let's put Tom here and let's put concentrating. That's what he's doing. He's concentrating on his work. And then he's asking, you know, why are you calling it work? It's not every day you get to work. So he's making it. So see, Tom is like turning it now. This is where there's a little trickery involved. And now all of a sudden he's making it sound like you don't get a chance to do this every day. Like this is pretty special. So then what does Ben say after he hears Tom say, you don't get to do this every day. What does Ben say? Can I wash whitewash the fence? Yeah. Uh-huh. Let me do it. So I'm going to put let me. That's just a slang for let me. Let me dot, dot, dot. That's what Ben's saying. He's like, let me have a turn. And then what does Tom say to that? Does Tom let him have a turn? At uh, first? Doesn't he kind no. of say like, mm, let me think. Yeah, no, he <laughs> says, I reckon there ain't one boy in a thousand, maybe 2000 that can do it the way it's got to be done. So he's saying, Nope, it's too special. You can't do it. So I'm going to put no comma and then only one in 2000. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, okay, so he's saying, no, you can't. You can't. This is too special and you don't know how to do it right. All right. So then we go back to Ben here. By the way, this is the middle, this is the middle paragraph. So this is talking about the conflict that's going on. And so obviously Ben's having fun, pretending to be a ship. Tom is having to work, but now the tables are starting to turn because Tom's trying to make it sound like I'm actually doing something fun. And he's trying to draw in Ben to take on his job for him so that he can have fun and get lots of treasures and all that. So at this point, Ben is eating an apple. I'm going to put apple here. And then at that point, what, what about Tom? What happens at that point? They go back and forth. And then what does Tom finally decide to do? Let him paint it. 
Yeah. So Tom is like, he gives in, right? So I'm going to put T here, gives in. And then I'm going to put he allows dot, dot, dot. So he allows Ben to get involved. Okay. So I like this part. Let me see where I can find it here. Ah, it's toward the bottom of page 50 of, of the story. Uh, that second to the last paragraph, Tom gave up the brush with reluctance in his face, but alacrity in his heart. And while the late streamer or steamer, Big Missouri worked and sweated in the sun, the retired artist sat on a barrel in the shade close by, dangling his legs, munched his apple, and planned the slaughter of more innocents. <laughs> so I like that. Uh, I like that. So I'm going to use that for number four. I'm going to put plans. So now that he's got Ben working, he's plans the slaughter of more innocents. Basically more innocent people. And he's thinking of his friends. So he's like, ooh, okay, I got this plan now. All right. And then we're going to go on to Roman numeral three. This is when we're start going to, we're going to start resolving the, the issue. So we've got it's already starting to get resolved here because Ben is now taking on this job. Who else comes on the scene? Now we're looking at, uh, what are the boys' names in that last paragraph on page 50? Billy Fisher. Billy Fisher. So I'm just gonna put Billy here. <clears throat> and then who else comes along? <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Is so it another? Johnny Miller. Johnny yeah, Miller? Johnny Miller. Uh huh. So Johnny. And uh, probably some other friends that aren't unnamed. So we can just put generic friends here. They all get a turn painting, but in order to get their turn, what do they have to do? Trade him. Trade, right. Trade, what, what are they trading? Basic treasure. Treasures, yeah. I was going to say junk, but like... <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's his treasure. <laughs> so. Yeah, it to him it's treasure, or to the boys, I guess it's treasure. But yeah, to us it would be like junk. Um, but yeah, so they're trading treasures, and then what are what are some of the things that they trade? I remember the one dead rat on a string. A dead rat on a string. What were you gonna say, Grant? One-eyed cat. One-eyed cat. So I'm just gonna put cat, and then I'm just gonna draw one eye there <laughs> uh what else jasper what else are they trading this is on page 51 actually i think it's 50 has some on it too a piece of blue glass blue glass yes I'm just gonna put glass. All a right. A dog collar. A dog collar. I'll just put collar here. There's lots of stuff. So they're trading all of this. And then um, this is when the moral of the story all comes together when Tom Sawyer makes this realization about humanity. So if you look at page 51, in that last paragraph, what do we learn? Um, actually, the last paragraph is just one sentence. So right, right before that. It's that, a hollow world. It's a hollow world, yes. Right after that, what's that next sentence? He had discovered... 
Somebody run and read that sentence. I discovered that life ain't, uh, hold on. It's that second sentence in the, in the second to the last paragraph. Second sentence. Great law of human action. Yes. Great law of human action. Keep reading that, uh, Melina. Without knowing it, namely that in order to make a man or boy covet a thing, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. Yes. And so he's basically saying, if you make it sound like work, nobody's going to want to do it. But if you make it sound like it's not work, you can actually convince somebody to do it. So that was the big revelation that he had about his experience with painting the fence and with his friends and all that. And it's funny, the next sentence after that says, if he had been a great and wise philosopher, like the writer of this book, he would now have comprehended that work consists of whatever a body is obliged to do. And that play consists of whatever a body is not obliged to do. So he's basically Tom Sawyer's tooting his own horn there saying, you know, if Tom Sawyer was as smart as me, the writer, then he would know. So <laughs> basically, um, if you're obligated to do it, it's work. If you're not obligated to do it, it's not work. So it's all in how you look at it. So anyway, um, so number three, we'll just put want. And then um, if it's difficult, I'm going to put some dots here, difficult. Then um, you're not going to want to do it if it's difficult. So you got to make sure that it's uh, it is only necessary to make the thing difficult to attain. So if you make it, if you want something and you make it difficult to attain that, then it's actually, there's a drive to want it more. Okay, so that's what that means here. Want, like if you want it, if you want it and you make it difficult to get, that makes you want it even more. All right, I'm gonna leave for blank on this. Um, and we're gonna do something different this week with your homework. I know that, I know Grant, you came in a little late, but that's okay. Um, we did, the paragraph one was part of your homework assignment and I saw that you turned it in already, which is awesome. I haven't had a chance to grade it yet. So uh, we were rewriting that first paragraph from the original story. I'm gonna change it up a little bit for this following week. So you're good with that paragraph that you turned in and Melina and Jasper are gonna turn it in by Wednesday. And then the following week, what we're going to do now is actually you're going to write your own version of this story. So we're just going to do that first paragraph as a rewrite of the actual Tom Sawyer for this, this homework that's due on Wednesday. And then the following week, we're going to change it up and you're going to create your own version of the story, which means you can change the characters' names. And um, think of a different scenario for these characters. Like instead of this Tom Sawyer story that took place in 1876 in rural Missouri, you can think of a different setting. So I want you to get out a clean piece of paper here. I'm going to help you come up with some ideas on this. Um, and you get to, this is where you actually get to be really creative. I think this will be kind of fun. This is our last lesson for unit three. And then next week, when we do our next lesson, we're moving on to more like research paper and more academic writings and things like that. This is the last one we're going to do that has more of a fictional storytelling type stories. So we're going to have some fun with it. So go ahead and put uh, characters. These are just notes from class. So um, actually, huh, go ahead and put your name. Sorry, I already messed up on this. Name, date, today is November 28th. By the way, tomorrow's my birthday. Woohoo. Birthday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
All right, so you can change up the character. Um, go ahead and, and put make up new name. Sorry, my pen is not cooperating today. Make up new name so you don't have to use Tom Sawyer. Don't use Tom Sawyer. You can use fictional names. Just make up some names for your characters. Your setting. could be um, work, like, oh, man, my pen is gonna drive me nuts today. Uh, let's say you work at Walmart or uh, in and out or, you know, these are just exa examples, or it could be that the setting is in outer space or at a space station, where, where are some other settings, just random settings that you can think of? Maybe like an office. Office, yep, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, could be a doctor's office, or it could be an office that you work at. Um, could be, uh, on an island. Of course, there's the classic forest. Or it could be the Grand Canyon. I mean, you guys can go crazy with this, okay? These are just, I'm just kind of getting your juices flowing here. You don't have to pick from this list. By the way, you can make up new names, but the, it could also be like employees. Or it could be uh, relatives. So basically, you're going to take the core of this story, Tom Sawyer, and the whole idea of how he had a job to do. So you'll think of another job that he has to do, like your character has to do, and, um, and use the same theme as far as how he manipulated his friend's thinking into doing the job and him getting off scot-free, okay? That, that whole core theme needs to stay intact in your story. But you get to change the characters, uh, the setting. You can change uh, the situation. It could be a completely different situation. Okay, same basic problem of the plot, but everything else is your own design. You, you get to be creative and use your imagination. And you need to stay close to the original, but you could also be like really wild and, and crazy with your ideas too. That's okay. I know Grant likes to go off on, on tangents sometimes with the way he writes, which I like because it's like, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. And that kind of takes you down this little trail. So you can let your imagination go with this, but you guys understand to keep the same type of theme for your version of this story. Um, and the great, we, we learn the great human truth in order to make a man want something, you have to make it difficult to attain. So you wanna keep that theme the same. Now, if you want to write a new outline, you can. If you wanna use your original outline with Tom Sawyer, you can, and then just in your mind, switch it up as you write, that's okay too. You don't have to turn in a brand new outline for me. The one that we just did together, you can use that, but try to, try to stay away from Mark Twain's words. Um, you know, that part where he's, he's talking about, um, magnificent and great inspiration and all of that you know you want to come up with your own words so you're not trying to be mark twain but you're going to be yourself when you're writing but come up with a new a new scenario does that make sense to you guys okay cool so hopefully you're already starting to think of what you can do be have fun with it this is our last like i said this is our last assignment that's kind of on the creative imaginary side um, so you can kind of just let your brain go with that. Another thing I wanted to show you here on your uh, on your paper, when you use, you're going to use three paragraphs. You're going to write three paragraphs like you would normally. Um, 
But when you have conversations, did you guys notice, I know it's almost time to go, but did you notice on the original story on page 50, look at that really quick here. Did you notice that they indented this conversation? This conversation has just quotes. There's no attribution with it, like we talked about in the grammar lesson. So you are welcome to write in that style because then you're not saying Tom said, or, or let's say your character's name is Bob and then your other character's name is Chuck. And you wouldn't say Chuck said, Bob said, Chuck said, Bob said. You can, if you want dialogue like this, this is how you would set it up, indent each time someone's speaking. But this is still considered a paragraph, even though it has several indents right here, indentations. Okay. Um, so you can you can be creative with that, but you're still going to keep it at three paragraphs. Does that make sense to you guys? Good. Okay. All right. Um, so you're going to have those pages in grammar, those four pages uh, that we learned at the beginning of class. You're going to use your checklist on page 53 for your new story that you're writing. Um, use your checklist for each paragraph. So that means you're still going to include your LY adverb and underline it. You're still going to include a who, which clause, a strong verb. We talked about that earlier. Try to avoid ing words and then a because clause. So make sure that those are in each paragraph of your new story that you write. And then there's a list on your checklist of the banned words. I, I actually am going to start removing points if I find a banned word in your story. So make sure you really pay attention to that. So those banned words, say, said, go, went, see, saw, all of those, don't use those anymore. Y'all have to come up with new, new ways to say that. All right, that's it for this week. Do you guys have any questions about anything? Are you good? The homework is just to rewrite Tom Sawyer in our own version and do the four pages in grammar. Correct. And rewriting means, yeah, changing up everything as far as the characters, the setting, the situation, but keeping the same theme from the original. Yeah. So you can kind of really use your imagination, but yep, you got it, Grant. That's right. All right, I'm good. Yep. Anybody else questions? You're good? All right, you guys have a great week. I'll see you next Thursday at our regular time. Okay, bye.